Welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm your host, Wayne Zool. October is here and fall is in full swing. The days are getting cooler and the nights are getting colder, offering great views of the moon, planets, a couple of meteor showers, a comet, and an annular eclipse. We'll also explore a very interesting mountain range on the moon. And lastly, since Halloween is coming, we'll explore some of the scariest deep sky objects in the sky. It's going to be a lot of fun, so let's get to it and start with our monthly planet roundup. This month, Mercury will be extremely difficult to spot, as it will appear near the Sun all month. The first few evenings of October might offer those with an excellent western horizon a glimpse, but it will be difficult to pick the planet out of the twilight glow. Thankfully, Venus is a bit easier to see this month. On October 1st, Venus sets at 7.54 p.m., and is shining brightly at magnitude minus 3.9 while showing an 85% illuminated gibbous phase that spans about 12 arc seconds across. By the 31st, spotting Venus will be easy. On Halloween, it will set at 7.54 p.m. while glowing at magnitude minus 4. It's now only 77% illuminated, but it's just over 14 arc seconds across. To see Venus this month, you're going to need a good western horizon. While as bright as Venus is, it doesn't get very high in the sky after sunset. It should become visible when it's around 9 or 10 degrees above the horizon. It is worth trying to spot it if you can. On the evening of October 5th, the nearly three-day-old waxing crescent moon will appear 3.5 degrees due south of Venus. You'll need binoculars to pick the pair out of the twilight glow, but spotting them will be a real treat. Mars begins October in Gemini and rises at 11.51 p.m. The red planet will be glowing at magnitude 0.5 and will span 7.5 arc seconds wide. On the 29th, Mars moves into the constellation Cancer and by the end of the month, Mars will rise around 10.50 p.m. and will have brightened to magnitude 0 as the disk of the planet now spans 9 arc seconds wide. Being able to spot details on Mars is beginning to get a little easier, and as the year goes on, it will get even better. On October 24th, the last quarter moon will be 5.5 degrees south of Mars, making for a beautiful pairing in the morning sky. Jupiter spends all of October in Taurus. On the 1st, the largest planet in our solar system rises at 10.07 p.m. and is glowing brightly at magnitude minus 2.5, while its disk spans 42 arc seconds across. By Halloween, Jupiter will rise just after 8 p.m. and will have brightened to magnitude minus 2.7, and its disk appears to have grown to 46 arc seconds across. Jupiter appears stunning to the naked eye as a bright yellowish star. In binoculars, you can see the shape of the planet, and you can also spot the four Galilean moons. In a telescope, Jupiter is fun and exciting to observe. Its features can change noticeably over a period of just several hours, and since the planet rotates in about 10 hours, we also get to enjoy seeing different features move across the planet in a single night. If Jupiter is up when I'm observing, I'm always going to give it a look. On October 20th, going into the morning of the 21st, the 81% illuminated waning gibbous moon will be just over 5 degrees north of Jupiter, making for a beautiful naked eye and binocular pairing. On October 1st, Saturn rises about an hour before the sun sets, placing it low on the eastern horizon at sunset. As the night goes on, the ring planet will appear higher until it transits the meridian at 11.17 p.m. and sets at 4.55 a.m. Saturn is now glowing at magnitude 0.7, and with the rings, the system spans 44 arc seconds across. By the end of October, Saturn will have dimmed to magnitude 0.8, and will appear slightly smaller at just under 43 arc seconds across, and the planet will set at 2.50 a.m. Saturn spends all of October in the constellation Aquarius. Having reached opposition last month, Saturn will be in the sky when the sun sets, making it a popular target to observe. Next year, Saturn's rings will appear on edge before opening up again to their widest in 2032. 
The reason for this is due to Saturn's axial tilt. Here's a way to try to visualize this using two people, a ball, and some cardboard. Cut out a disc of cardboard about three times the diameter of the ball. Then cut a hole in the center of the cardboard just a hair smaller than the diameter of the ball. Now place the cardboard rings on the ball. Use glue or tape if you need to. Now one of you will stand 20 feet from the other person and will be holding the Saturn model. Tilt the model to the north about 20 degrees while holding it at eye level. The other person is standing 20 feet away looking at you, still holding Saturn and keeping the 20 degree tilt to the north. Now walk in a circle around the other person. From their perspective, the rings will start off wide open and as they get to the 90 degree position, the rings will now appear on edge. At 180, they're wide open and at 270 degrees, they're on edge again. The tilt doesn't change, but the perspective that we see it from does. On October 14th, the 91% illuminated waxing gibbous moon will be 3.5 degrees south of Saturn, making for a nice pairing in the sky. Uranus is in Taurus all month long. You can find it about 5 degrees south of the Pleiades. On the 1st, Uranus rises at 10.38 p.m. and transits the meridian just before 4 a.m. Uranus can be spotted with the naked eye under very dark skies. The planet glows dimly at magnitude 5.7 and its disk is just under 4 arc seconds across. By Halloween, Uranus will rise at 6.37 p.m. and transits the meridian at 1.52 in the morning. But its brightness and size will not have changed by a noticeable amount. You can spot Uranus easily with binoculars, even under light polluted skies. However, it will just appear as a bluish star in binoculars. You'll need a telescope, good seeing, and decent magnification to make out the disk of the planet, but seeing it is definitely worth the effort. Neptune is in Pisces all month and is faint at magnitude 7.7. .7. Its disk is just over two arc seconds across. In order to spot Neptune, you'll need binoculars or a telescope and a good finder chart. Seeing this distant planet can be aided by using the stars 20 and 24 Piscium, as right now, Neptune forms an equilateral triangle with this pair of stars. Because it's so distant, Neptune doesn't change appearance very much this month. Observers in Chile and Argentina will have a chance to observe an angular eclipse on October 2nd. The moon will be near its furthest point from Earth and will appear smaller in the sky than the sun. So during the eclipse, it won't get dark, but the light will look thin. Angular eclipses are fun to see but require constant eye protection. The partial phases can be observed from as far north as Lima, Peru, as well as Hawaii, and northern New Zealand, and Antarctica could see a partial eclipse as well. I'll leave a link in the show notes with information about the eclipse. There are two meteor showers of note this October. The Orionids peak on the 21st at 2 a.m. Eastern Time. Unfortunately, the waning gibbous moon will be nearby and its light will make seeing meteors extremely difficult. A minor shower, the October Camelopardalids, will peak on the morning of October 6th. This shower produces a variable rate of meteors, so you might see none or maybe a dozen or more. Fortunately, its radiant is high in the sky before sunrise, located about halfway between Polaris and Dube in Ursa Major. A few months ago, we discussed Comet Suchinchan Atlas, which had reportedly broken up. Fortunately, those reports were false, and the comet is intact and should be visible, possibly to the naked eye this month. The comet will be visible low in the morning skies, before sunrise for the first few days of the month, before it makes its closest approach to Earth on October 12th. A few days after closest approach, the comet should be visible low in the western sky after sunset in Serpens, climbing a little higher each night. The comet is currently around magnitude 3.5, making it visible to the naked eye from a dark site. There are some new predictions that it could get as bright as magnitude minus 4, although comets are known to be wildly unpredictable. So, we shall see. I've left a link to an interesting article about the comet, as well as a link for how to see it from your location. 
Here's our quick space mission update for October. Last month, SpaceX made history with the launch of the Polaris Dawn mission that saw the first commercial spacewalks. The mission was a complete success. Regarding SpaceX, it looks like the next Starship test flight won't occur until at least November. There are a couple of important planetary missions scheduled to launch in October. On October 7th, SpaceX is scheduled to launch the ESA's HERA mission on a Falcon 9 to the double asteroid Didymos and Dimorphos, the pair that was visited by the DART mission in September of 2022. The HERA mission will examine the long-lasting effects of the impact from DART. By the way, if you want to have a little fun, just go to Google and search DART mission. Just a few days later, on October 10th, SpaceX will launch the Europa Clipper on a Falcon Heavy. This mission will visit Jupiter, where it will do as many as 45 flybys of the Jovian moon Europa. The closest approach to the moon will be a mere 25 kilometers, or around 15 miles, from the surface of Europa. The spacecraft will study the ice shell of this moon to help us understand the icy world of Europa and what its subsurface ocean may be hiding. The probe will fly past Mars in February of 2025. Then it will fly past Earth again in January of 2026 before arriving at Jupiter in April of 2030. Expect great things from this mission. Now it's time for the Lunar Feature of the Month. This month, we're going to explore one of my favorite lunar features, Matus Apenninus. This mountain range was named by Johannes Hevelius after the Apennine mountain range in Europe. You may remember Hevelius as he also named last month's lunar feature of the month. I've left a link to that in the show notes. This mountain range dominates the lunar landscape, forming a dramatic curve that hugs the northeastern edge of Mare Imbrium, known as the Sea of Rains. It begins just to the west of the terrace crater Aristophanes. Ridiculous. Stretching for over 600 kilometers, or more than 360 miles, these peaks rise sharply, with some of the tallest reaching heights of nearly 5 kilometers, or 3 miles tall. The Apenninus Range is especially prominent because it marks the boundary of an ancient impact basin. The moon's surface was shaped by countless impacts over billions of years, and when the Imbrian Basin was formed, it left behind this jagged rim of mountains. In fact, this region is of great interest to scientists because it is a treasure trove of geologic history. One of the most famous spots along Montes Apenninus is the Apollo 15 landing site. In 1971, astronauts David Scott and James Irwin landed their lunar module near Hadley Rill, a winding channel at the base of Montes Apenninus. Their mission included geological studies of the mountains, which provided some of the most detailed insight into the moon's volcanic and impact history. For observers, Montes Apenninus is a stunning feature to observe when the moon is around first quarter. That's when the shadows cast by the peaks are long, giving the range a three-dimensional appearance. With even a modest telescope, you can trace the rugged peaks and valleys and imagine the view that the Apollo 15 astronauts had as they gazed across this awe-inspiring landscape. This feature is best seen from first quarter till around just before last quarter. Let's now move on to our deep sky tour. This month, our tour will be a little different, as several of the objects on the list are too faint to be seen with amateur instruments. Because of that, I'm not going to explain how to locate them, although in the episode guide, there will be links to locate them all, so please use that if you need it. Being that Halloween is coming, I thought it would be fun to come up with a list of the 10 scariest deep sky objects. Coming in at number 10 is the only open cluster on our list. You may recognize this object, which is the easiest one on our list to observe, as NGC 457 also known as the ET Cluster, located in Cassiopeia. This cluster is listed at magnitude 6.4, and it spans 13 arc minutes in size. It is located just over 7,900 light years away from us. This is a fun cluster to enjoy on October evenings. Up next at number 9 is our only object that's not visible from the Northern Hemisphere, 
located in the large Magellanic Cloud, which is a satellite of the Milky Way, lies 30 Doradus, which is commonly known as the Tarantula Nebula. It gets its name from the long dusty filaments that surround the dark nebula, marking the body of the Tarantula. It is the largest and brightest star-forming region near our galaxy, and it is home to the hottest, most massive stars known. Claiming the eighth spot, we have another relatively easy target, the Bat Nebula, cataloged as NGC 6995, which is part of the Eastern Veil Nebula in Cygnus. While I can sort of see a bat in flight, this isn't the most obvious of the objects on our list, but it is pretty easy to see, and it's still a fun object. Moving right along at number 7, we have LDN1622, which is commonly known as the Boogeyman Nebula. Ooh. Found near Barnard's Loop in Orion, this object is a dark nebula that is clearly shaped like the Boogeyman. It is an area of gas and dust in front of the Reflection Nebula Vandenberg 62. This is an area of active star formation, although much of it is not visible as we can observe it through the dust of the Boogeyman. But infrared observations have shown this to be the case. Number six brings us to another object that is within reach of amateur instruments under dark skies with the help of a nebula filter. Surrounding the open cluster NGC 7380 is Sharpless 2-142, which is commonly known as the Wizard Nebula. This complex is located in the circumpolar constellation Cepheus the King. The nebula spans more than half a degree in size and is located 8,500 light years away from us. Looking at it, you can easily see the hat, the nose, and the hands of the wizard casting a spell into the night. Landing at number five, we have the ghost of Cassiopeia. This nebula looks a lot like the old sheet over the head type of ghost. This nebula is actually a combination of emission and reflection nebula. Sharpless 2-185 is the emission nebula, while the reflection nebula is cataloged as IC63. This is tough to spot visually, as it's only about 20 arc minutes away from Gamma Cassiopeia, or NAVI, which at magnitude 2.15 outshines the nebula for most visual observers. But it is a favorite among astrophotographers. The ghost of Cassiopeia is located around 10,500 light years away from us. Object number four on our list brings us back to the Veil Nebula in Cygnus. Although we're now looking at the Western Veil, which is commonly known as the Witch's Broom Nebula. Relatively easy to see from a moderately dark sky, this nebula really does look like a witch's broom, like a Nimbus 2000 right out of Harry Potter. Cataloged as NGC 6960 and situated next to the fourth magnitude star 52 Cygni, the Witch's Broom, like the Bat Nebula, are both supernova remnants. They were formed when a massive star exploded between 10 and 20,000 years ago, and they're located around 2,400 light years from us. Grabbing the number three spot, we have a truly scary pair of objects that are known as the Flying Bat and Giant Squid Nebula. The Flying Bat is a hydrogen alpha emission nebula cataloged as Sharpless 2-129. The Giant Squid is a region of doubly ionized oxygen, or O3, and is cataloged as OU4. The pair is extremely faint and requires many hours of exposure under dark skies to show the pair well. They were discovered in the 1950s using the 48-inch Schmidt camera at Mount Palomar. Securing the number two spot on our list is the Skull Nebula, another star-forming region in Cepheus. The bright star-forming region NGC 7822 is where the nose would be on the skull. You can see where the jaw is separated and the two eye sockets above NGC 7822 are obvious to see in images. The nebula is cataloged as Sharpless 171. The whole complex is pretty large, being more than two degrees in diameter. It is 79 light years wide and it's located about 2,900 light years away from us. And finally, coming in at number one, we have the Witch Head Nebula. 
cataloged as IC2118. The witch head is an extremely large and faint reflection nebula. It spans nearly three degrees long and around one degree wide. This cloud of gas is reflecting the light of the magnitude zero star Rigel in Orion. IC2118 is located in the neighboring constellation, Eridanus, the river. It is located about 900 light years away from us. This nebula may actually be the remains of a very ancient supernova. And it takes very little imagination to see the witch's face with her crooked nose. To me, this one just screams Halloween. Hopefully, you enjoyed our fun and scary tour this month. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a text or a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join our Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You can also visit our YouTube channel, The Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other scary surprises. Please do all the podcasts and YouTube things, such as like, subscribe, comment, and share. It really does help. If you'd like to support the Astro Guy podcast and YouTube channel, you can simply buy us a cup of coffee. The money is used to maintain and update the equipment that we use to create and publish the show. The link is in the show notes. Thank you again for joining us, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum. Seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.